But here's the point of that, that physical therapist, lovely person. Her encouragement to dad was very specific. She was telling him exactly where to put his hands at different points, therapy, trying to get in the car. She was telling him to back up to the door so his legs would feel the back of the door. And she was telling him to put his hand back here. Um, and when he got up from like his wheelchair, she made sure the wheels were locked or he made, she wanted him to make sure the wheels were locked so he could put his hands on the wheelchair handles because that was stable, not to, not to pull himself up from his walker that was unstable. The whole point of this is that they had very specific wisdom for my dad because his memory, he's dealing with some memory loss, very specific memory reminders to him that provided stability. You could see the uncertainty in my dad's transition sometimes from sitting to getting up. There was, there was insecurity in his eyes. Am I, am I going to stay up? He's insecure. But the PT, the OT, all the, the therapy was encouraging him with some very specific steps that provided stability for him. And that's a good way to look at the wisdom of the Old Testament. See, God knows we're forgetful people. He knows that our memories need to be reminded. And so he does that in the Old Testament. Very specific reminders to you and to me that bring stability to our lives. That when we feel uncertain, we're unsteady because of the winds of the world, this culture, our own flesh, our own brokenness. When we're unsteady and we're forgetful, God can use the Old Testament in a particular way to bring some very specific wisdom to us that can provide stability for our lives. Our key phrase, the, the title for this time is called Everyday Wisdom from Old Friends. Everyday Wisdom. Everyday wisdom from old friends, the Old Testament. But the key passage that we are hanging all of this on this summer is found in Paul's second letter to his son in the faith, Timothy. He loves dearly. And this is what he says to Timothy, chapter 3 and verse 16. All of Scripture, every bit of it from Genesis to Revelation, not just our favorites. All of Scripture is God-breathed and it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Every bit of scripture is useful. It's beneficial. It's advantageous. It helps us get ready for the next day. Every bit of scripture, including the Old Testament. So we've been in Daniel. Micah walked us through Daniel. Some very particular, specific wisdom we were in Psalms last week, a couple particular Psalms. But I'm excited this morning, not quite as excited as Perry was, but, but I am excited to walk us through a part of the Old Testament that sometimes is joked about. It's a part of the Old Testament that some people think, are oh, you've got to be kidding me. Is there anything of value in that part of the Bible? It is the driest and most boring part that I've heard about in the Bible. But I want to show you and walk you through how this particular chapter has become very dear to me. It has met me in some very particular, important, specific times that has deeply encouraged me. And that passage is Numbers. Numbers. Yep, Numbers. Chapter 1. Let me just read the first 15 verses for you. The Lord spoke to Moses in the tent of meeting, the desert of Sinai, on the first day of the second month of the second year after the Israelites came out of Egypt. And he said, take a census of the whole Israelite community by their clans and their families, listing every man by name, one by one. You and Aaron are to count according to their divisions all the men in Israel who are 22 years, who are 20 years old or more and able to serve in the army. One man from each tribe, each of them, the head of his family, is to help you. And these are the names of the men who are to assist you. From Reuben, Elazar, son of Shaddai. By the way, I flunked names in seminary, so um, we'll do the best we can. And Simeon, Shalumiel, son of Zerishadai. From Judah, Nashon, son of Amad, Amad, Abdab. Thank you. Shout it out if you know, please. Um, and from Judah, Nashon, son of 
I'm, oh, we already did that, didn't we? Issachar, Nathaniel, son of Zoar, Zebulun, Eliabad, uh, son of Helon, sons of Joseph. Hang in there, please. Um, from Ephraim, Elias, Elisha, um, um, son of Amadhud, from Manasseh, Gamelia, son of Pedazar, and Benjamin, Abaddon, son of Gideon, Onai, and Dan, Heiser, son of Ammonai, um, Shaddai, from Asher, Pagiel, son of Okran, and Gad, Elishaf, son of Duel, and from Naphtali, ah, oh, that was easy, uh, Hira, son of Enon. So my goal this morning is to show you how the likes of scripture like that can actually turn into some deeply meaningful, important, beneficial, advantageous, ready for the next day type of wisdom. So here's a picture of the whole of, from my Bible of, of Numbers chapter 1. You can see there's just name after name after name and a lot of numbers, a lot of numbers. But what that chapter will do in your heart and my heart this morning, no doubt, it's going to remind us what Greg so well did in his, in his call to worship this morning. He's going to remind us that God knows your name. He knows your name. And he also knows the name of your neighbors. He knows the names of your colleagues. He knows the names of the people in your life that he has purposely brought you next to, that he wants to use the likes of you and me to draw them to Jesus. He knows their name too. But it's critical. How do we handle parts of the Bible like this well? So that we don't make it say what we want it to say. But we treat this scripture well and rightly. So how do I read the Old Testament well? First of all, we, you have to know context. You have to know the type of literature it is. You have to know the author's intent, what he's trying, he or she is trying to get across. Uh, and how does it point to Jesus? Because Jesus himself said the whole of the Old Testament, you name it points to me. So that's a valid question to ask any part of the Old Testament. How might this be pointing to Jesus? So I encourage you, get some tools. Take some time, take responsibility, and get a study Bible or download a study Bible app. Go to the Bible Project. Wonderful site. Pick a book of the Bible. Google that with Bible, the Bible Project. It'll show you a wonderful overview, visually, spot on of the purpose, intent, background, context. And get this book, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. It's been around for a while. Wonderful book to help you handle the variety of literature in the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, that book will help you understand how to use and read well the different parts of the Bible. Now, I'm going to quote a couple of lines from that in particular in a second. So the context of Numbers 1 is very particular. It's, it's in the Pentateuch. It's the first five books of the Old Testament. And it's after the children of Israel have left Egypt. God delivered them from Egypt, slavery there, and they've been wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years. But he's preparing them to enter the promised land. So Numbers and Deuteronomy in particular are helping the children of Israel get ready for the next challenge in their life, the next season in their life. And it's not going to be easy. But part of that preparation is to said, take a census. Count how many fighting men you, you have 20 years and above. This is important because if you might know the story, all the old warriors have died off now. There are no men in Israel that have ever fought before. God has to get this nation ready to encounter the people in the promised land that don't want them there. And one way to get them ready for that is find out who do you have. That's why this census is so critical to getting them ready to enter the promised land. These are fresh newbies to war. The type of literature this is, it's a narrative and it's historical. It's a combination of both. It's not poetical and it's not prophetic. It is historical narrative. 
So here's some quotes of how to handle historical narrative in the Old Testament well, how to get it from what you read to what might make a difference and helpful Monday morning or even this afternoon. Old Testament narrative usually illustrates a doctrine or doctrines that are taught propositionally elsewhere. So at Old Testament narrative, the stories, they illustrate Things that are taught more specifically often in the New Testament and other places even in the scriptures. Narratives may teach either explicitly something, clearly stating truth, or implicitly by clearly implying something without actually stating it. So that's what we can look for in narrative and historical literature like this. What is it either explicitly saying or implicitly illustrating something about the truth of God or later on? more specifically stated in the New Testament. But it also says in How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, this is where I'm getting these quotes from, notice repetition. It says that repetition pervades Hebrew narrative. When you read old, when we read Old Testament narrative, historical narrative, watch for repeated words. They're there for a purpose. They're there to get our attention. And first and probably most important, the book says, is repetition of key words. And we're going to show you some key words repeated in Numbers 1 that are very significant. So in my preparation, I envisioned myself putting down my Bible and going, okay, now we got through that part. Now I get to show you how it's useful, how it's blessed my heart, and I hope how it can bless yours. Not only from these principles, but this has got to be read in community. This is something that we do as friends. We read the Bible as friends so that we don't get off track. We might read some Old Testament narrative, think we're right on track, and some friends are going, wait, 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 wait a minute. Not quite. So how is it useful? Here it is. Numbers 1 reminds us, tells us, explicitly in some ways, implicitly in other ways, that the Lord speaks to us daily and personally. The Lord, the God of all creation, wants to speak into your life every day, every moment, and he wants to do it in a very personal way. In such a way that he knows your day. He knows your heart. And he wants to take the likes of the Old Testament and use it to speak to your day, my day, in a very particular way. So Numbers chapter 1. 1. Here's the first phrase that we'll jump off from. The Lord spoke to Moses in the tent of meeting in the desert of Sinai on the first day of the second month of the second year after the Israelites came out of Egypt, the Lord spoke to Moses. What this implicitly reminds us of, what it illustrates, is that the God of all creation is not silent. He speaks, and he speaks to his people. He spoke to Moses. You'll see the phrase here. Uh, this pairs nicely with, this passage pairs nicely with, by the way, I was kind of tickled that I thought of that phrase. It pairs nicely with. It's not something that I usually use or even are involved in, but somehow I know what that means. I know it's a thing. So this pairs nicely with 2 Timothy 3, which we've already read. The word of God is living. It's God-breathed. And it tells us what's right, what's not right, how to get right, how to stay right. It speaks to us. God speaks to us. He has breathed his word it's a word for inspired. But it also pairs nicely with Exodus chapter 33, verses 7 through 11, because this is where, in another part of the Bible, it talks about this place called the Tent of Meeting. Listen to what is described of this place. Now, Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away. This is in the wilderness when they were still wandering around, calling it the Tent of Meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go into the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrance of their tents. And they watched Moses until he entered the tent. And as Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and they worshipped, each at the entrance to their tent. 
And the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Is that not astounding? The God of all creation who created everything that we see knows the 8 billion people on this planet wants to speak to you as a friend speaks to a friend. It's what God wants for you and for me in our communication with him as a friend speaks to a friend. And then Moses would return to the camp at his young age, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. That's another whole world to just meditate on and think about that, but God speaks to us daily and personally. It pairs nicely with Exodus 33, 7, friend to friend. There's also something about a place. Just contemplate this tent of meaning, this place. Implications, explicitly, implicitly. What does that mean for you? When I'm vacuuming, yeah, yes, I did. Vince and I vacuum at home. I'm patting myself on the back. Um, but sometimes when I walk into my, my study at home and I'm vacuuming on Saturdays and I see my desk there, something physiologically happens in me that I look forward to Sunday morning, the next morning, when I'm going to be there thinking about our time, doing some final preparation. And I know the Lord is going to speak to me at that place, at that desk that I'm vacuuming under. And I get excited about the next morning because of the interaction I'm going to have with my God. The Holy Spirit, as he prepares me with words for you and for me and for our friends. But it also pairs nicely with John chapter 15. This is the part of the gospel of John where Jesus is saying some of the most important last things to his friends before he goes to the cross. And he says this, starting in verse 13, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Face to face as a friend speaks to a friend. Jesus, the son of God. We can have that intimacy with him as a friend speaks to a friend. I have called you friends. So the Lord spoke to Moses. That's the first statement that lets us know God wants to speak to us, his people. But the second phrase in Numbers chapter 1, excuse me, it's actually verse 2, it says this. Take a census of the whole Israelite community by their clans and families, listen, listing every man by name. One by one. I want to show you the other highlighted or picture of my Bible that I did in between these two slides. You can see the next slide coming up. You see the highlights? I went through because I hope they show up. I highlighted by name, one by one, by name, one by one, and 20. By name, one by one, 22. Verse 24, by name, verse 26, by name, verse 28, by name, I'm doing this on purpose. Verse 30, by name, verse 32, by name, verse 34, by name, verse 36, by name, 38, by name. Verse 40, by name, 42, by name. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to, to figure out God wants by name to get through to our heads. He repeated it 14 times in case we missed it the first five, six, ten. 14 times by name, one by one. That's a great illustration of how in Hebrew narrative, if there's repeated words, pay attention to that. There's some lesson. There's some truth. There's something in scripture that's important for you and for me. So this pairs nicely with Luke chapter 15. First 10 verses. I'm just going to read these two and see if you can pick up. Because this is where the, some of our memories can go. And now the tax collectors and the sinners, they were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they, they muttered. They said, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. 
And then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 and go into the open country and go after that lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and his neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is, re there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. By name. One by one. Even though there are 8 billion people on this planet, individuals matter to God. You matter to God. He cares about one. He knows your name. He knows the name of our neighbors. He knows the names of our colleagues. He knows the names of everyone in our circle of influence that he loves dearly. He knows their name too, as well as he knows yours. He knows the stories behind your name. He knows why you were named the way you were. He knows your middle name. He knows my middle name is Lowell. My name is Jeffrey Lowell Good. When my mom and dad first were married, moved from Pennsylvania to Tacoma, my dad was a pilot. They settled in at a church. They were brand newly weds. Had been married long, and the Lord settled them into a wonderful church. The name of the pastor of their church in Tacoma, Washington, was Lowell Went. Guess who I got named after? Their first pastor that they loved. Lowell Went. If you search, he had brothers. They were very influential on the West Coast during those days. Lowell Went. Funny, isn't it? From birth, I was named after a pastor. It's intriguing to me. He knows your name. He wants to speak to you daily and personally. So what is your action point from this? You remember Jesus is so important. The scriptures are so strong. It is not a big deal to sit here and, and read the, and listen to today. It's a good thing not to be minimized in any way, shape, or form. But the most important thing is what happens in our minds and lives and actions after we walk out of this place. What are we going to do with what we have heard today? James talks about how if you, we all looked in mirrors this morning and, and probably very few look the same right now than what we did when we first looked in the mirror this morning. And that's a good reason, isn't it? <laughs> so let that just sink in a little bit. Because if we don't obey what God has spoken to us about, we're like the man that looks himself in the mirror and goes away and doesn't change anything. It's not pretty at all. You might have heard the uh, iconic statement saying, uh, you, you know, give someone a sermon, a good Sunday sermon, and, and uh, you'll feed them for that Sunday. And that's a good thing, not to be minimized. But the saying goes on to say, but if you show that same person and a series cleverly entitled Everyday Wisdom for, what is the title? Everyday, from Old Friends, yes, right? <laughs> I knew I should have written that out more. Uh, uh, then you will feed this person for a lifetime. My heart, passion, goal what I want deeply, what I've experienced in my own life for you is that you would be able to go to the, the whole of the scriptures, Genesis to Revelation, and find the gold that is in every single book. Every single book. But it's going to take responsibility. It's going to take ownership. It's going to make us stop blaming somebody else for our spiritual intake. It's going to mean we're going to own it. I say, okay, God, I'm, I'm going to do what I need to do. This was poignantly illustrated 
And one of my dad's meals had a stroke June 13th. Things are still coming around for him, arms and legs. It's happening, but it's slow. And, and so we as his family, we were kind of right there doing stuff. And, and the OT people said, no, stop. And there's one meal in particular. They took the top off, and there's this big broccoli spear. And Dad likes broccoli. He wanted that. He goes, I can't eat that. And the OT said, well, what are you going to do about that, Amos? He goes, well, I, I would need to cut it. She goes, you're right. What do you have to cut it with? He goes, I got a knife. He picked up the knife. He picked up the fork. And he cut the broccoli spear by him self, cut it into three pieces, and he ate it. Nobody cut it for him. Nobody put it to his mouth. He picked up a knife, he picked up a fork, and he cut it. And that's what God is calling you and me to do today. Pick up your knife, pick up your fork, buy the books, get the resources, do the work, watch the videos, prepare yourself so you can read the whole of the Bible well, and know how to get something very particular for your day. I encourage you two action points in particular, early daily listening. If you're not particularly, if you're not in a habit right now of one of the first things that you do in the morning is think about the wisdom of God, I encourage you to change whatever habit is replacing that. The Apostle Paul in Romans 8 says this, the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. When we start our days thinking about the spirit right from the get-go, mindset for the day, it's life and peace. If we don't, something else is going to fill that vacuum. It's not going to be the spirit, and that we're going to pay the results of that. Through our day, through our first interaction with our spouse or children or parents or friends. But if we start the day with the wisdom of God, mindset in that way, then life and peace has a better chance of flowing from us. So daily, early listening. I encourage you to make changes so that you do that. We start our days in that way. But then secondly, I encourage you, try, quote unquote, that book. Like just go through the Old Testament. Go through the Old Testament book, list of books and it goes, no way, that book. Try it. Watch the video, read the book. Get some friends to help you. I just encourage you, if you've written off a part of the Old Testament, like Numbers 1 maybe, I encourage you to rethink that. Rethink that book. Get some help. Figure out how to mine the gold that is there. Figure out how to get the usefulness of that book and that truth of God into your life. Because if you do that, you've not just been fed for a day. You will have been fed and know how to feed for a lifetime. And have generational impact for the glory of God. And students, love students. You remember I was a youth pastor for 13 years before this. This move was not a step up. This was lateral at best. You have a, a lifetime in front of you to mine the word of God. Every single bit of it. And I just encourage you, don't write off any of it. I told you the story of when I was a, just a wee lad, uh, middle school, something like that. And, and somebody handed me the Living Bible by Kenneth Taylor. I started to read the Living Bible, and all of a sudden I realized, wow, this really can and does speak to me. Some of the stories I read just made great, better sense. Keep the, keep the NIV and the ESV and all the good translations too, but, but complement that with Living Bible, the message, something like that. Helpful, helpful. Let's take a moment and just uh, commit this to the Lord. I'm going to take some time to pray, but I want you to also just listen to the Spirit. And what is the Spirit saying to you this morning as to the next action step? What is He calling you to do? Maybe it's just saying, well done. Keep the patterns you're doing. Well done. Maybe, maybe the Spirit's saying something needs to get adjusted and changed and started. So let's pray for a second. Father, I am so grateful that your word is indeed living and it's active and it's sharp and it's useful. Every single word of it from Genesis to Revelation. Father, help us grow. Help us grow how to, to go, how to know to go to the whole scriptures. 
and, and find the gold and the usefulness and the truth. Father, help us to take responsibility. If we're blaming someone, some circumstance, whatever it is, Father, help us to just take ownership of that. Stop blaming and take responsibility. Do the work, Father, to free up your spirit, to speak well to us through your word. Father, you know every single person in this room today. You know where they are. I just pray that you would tailor these words, your words, to the particular needs of their heart. Encourage them wherever they are with the Bible. Maybe the Old Testament is not right yet. Maybe it's still right in the New Testament. Father, you let them know that. But Father, we also remember those two, those two stories. Your heart for ones that, that don't know you and don't love you yet are strong. It's strong for them. And Father, grow that in us. Grow that in me. You care about that one sheep that has not yet come to Jesus. You care about that one coin. Father, I thank you that out of the 8 billion people on this planet, you have a very particular care and knowledge. And you want to speak to us. Thank you, Father, for that. Help us in the precious and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him, for the wonders of His love. Praise God, praise God. So